Let's rock! So I'm Adrian Fanilovic, president of the ACMS, the Australian Computer Museum, and uh, today I wanted to show and tell the Shiva Land Rover. So Shiva uh, did a number of different uh, land products in the early 90s, a lot to do with uh, remote access. So I guess VPN, um, dialing VPNs and uh, remote access servers. And uh, one of their most popular products was this uh, Shiva Land Rover um, E or E Plus, or there's also the Shiva Land Rover um, N, I think it is. So that's what will come to me in a second. But basically, the E in Land Rover is for Ethernet, um, because sorry, there is a Land Rover T as well. If you get a T model, it actually means that it joins a token ring network. That's differential. Uh, the plus units actually have standard telephone RJ11 jacks on the back and you can also insert um, DB9 cards as well if you want to have your own modems or interface with another system. So basically it's it's a little ISP in a box really. All you do is you link, you put your Ethernet uh, either thin or thick um, or 10 base T onto your local network or onto an internet connection on the back. Then you connect up telephone lines and basically people from outside the company could dial in. These were actually V90 or V92 modems or even V34 modems. And it has a little remote access server in there that actually keeps the usernames, passwords, does your DHCP if you want it to, and connects people that are dialing into your local network. Now the best thing about these were they supported NetBUI, they supported Apple Talk, they supported TCP IP. So particularly for Mac users, which I believe was one of their most popular kind of uses back then, if you were a road warrior, you could dial into your company's head office, your phone call would go through the public switch telephone network, the PSTN, it would dial into one of these modems, up to eight modems in the back of the unit. It would then connect you to the local network in your office, which would give you access to your Apple Talk servers and printers. Um, it would also um, allow you to actually browse an Apple Talk network. And that's what I absolutely loved about them, or love about them, is that I've actually found that if we dial into this from a, an old Mac running Mac OS 7, 8, 9, and set the Apple Talk as um, remote access, we can actually see all of the Apple Talk printers and network servers locally here on the network from a dial-up connection, which is just awesome. Um, they also supported their own usernames and passwords. You could also do LDAP um, usernames and passwords, but it meant, you know, if you were a smaller business that didn't have the infrastructure, all you needed was this, you set up the usernames and passwords in there, you connect it to a bunch of phone lines off your PADX or direct to the wall, you give those uh, telephone numbers to your um, guys on the road and, or you know, log in from home and access everything like they're sitting at the office. Perfect for uh, COVID um, if you had it in 1994. <laughs> There's a few little weird anomalies with these devices that I've now come to learn. One is that they have a battery in the unit, which is a 3.6 volt VADA half double A. When you actually turn these units on, they have a one or two meg RAM memory inside. There's actually no software in them. There's a, there's a ROM chip that looks for a, um, a server to boot from, like a boot P server um, or the equivalent on a Mac. So when you first pull it out of the box, the unit does nothing except look on your network for a server. It's just sending out a boot P request looking for something to respond to its MAC address. So what you actually have to do is install software on a Mac or a PC. You turn on the unit. It then sends the MAC address out onto the network. A server with its MAC address listed in a boot P config goes, OK, hi, how's it going? Sends the actual package files back to the unit which it then loads into RAM. 
it then will start functioning as an actual unit. Very different to the way we do things now where we actually turn them on and there's software straight off the bat on the units. The actual unit will hold the software in config as long as there's a charged working battery in the unit. If the battery goes flat, it loses all of its config. So with this unit that we've got here, which is one of my own that I've got um, at the ACMS for actual uh, dial-up internet uh, emulation, I've replaced the half AA 3.6 volt battery with three AA um, batteries so that the config and the actual software stays on the unit so we don't have to have a boot P server here all of the time. Um, great little unit, pick them up on eBay. They, they've started to appreciate and value quite a bit because people love to, to you know, play with serial comms these days. But um, yeah, uh, the best thing about it is you can now come to the ACMS. We have a couple of computers that have uh, dial up and you can actually dial into this at 28k or 336 which is the most you can do over a standard uh, telephone connection and you can actually emulate and see what it was like to use the internet in the 90s and the early 2000s um, everything from the sounds and the time it takes to connect to problems with logging in and errors with passwords and usernames it really gives you that you know authentic experience particularly when you're trying to download say one floppy disk of information and it takes 15 20 minutes so uh, yeah definitely um, it's now been repaired thanks to our colleague Ivan who uh, fixed up the power supply in this one that died on us um, but yeah a great little piece of hardware and, and, and great fun so thanks any questions <laughs> No, you said Apple Talk. Yeah. So, I mean, nowadays, if you plug a PC into a LAN, like you know, an office, that's kind of like IP, yeah? So yeah, everything so. Everything gets an IP address. Is Apple Talk different? So, Apple Talk is like NetBUI on okay. a PC. So, for instance, on old PCs on Windows 95 and Windows 3.1, mm. if you went into the Network Explorer, you'd see all other PCs in your work group yeah. um, on your network. So this could actually be part of a, a work group as well. So for instance, if you dialed in from a Windows 98 PC and you were on this and then you went into your network and into your, you know, your, your company's um, uh, local name, whatever the work group was called, yeah. you'd actually see all of the PCs at your office that were online because it actually puts the net BUI traffic um, over. Oh, okay. So the there's RAS. something like a storage, like a shared drive or something. That's like correct. That. So Apple Talk was basically the same kind of idea. If anything, I think Apple Talk predated NetBUI by quite some time. Okay. But it was, I guess, Microsoft's what like comparable product that worked in the same kind of way. It was a, a simple um, networking protocol that required very little experience or knowledge. Um, it was, you know, if you were in the same Apple Talk Zone, as they call them, zones, or you know the work groups that Microsoft called them. You would see all the other users in that work group, the printers, shared resources, etc. So, the the coolest thing that I've done with this was when we dialed in from uh, an iMac on the other side of the room into this, we were able to print to a modern color laser photocopier um, from a 25 year old computer um, straight over. Apple Talk over dial up as if the printer was sitting in the same room and I found that quite um, fascinating that um, not only was the Apple Talk stack still in use on a lot of commercial copiers um, but it still works through antiquated hardware so that was um, quite cool so you know I would have loved to have one of these 20 years ago is what I'll say it would have <laughs> really been something um, actually 25 years ago would have been better but it really is a great piece of hardware. Mm. So thanks. Oh, and I should say, I've just got a, a, a photo here of the E Plus series. So you can see there's just a bunch of cards that get slotted in. So you could buy the actual units with as little as I think one or two cards from the factory. And then as your needs expanded, um, you could go up. So this is a, an, an eight. Uh, uh, well, this is an E plus, but there's also eight E's. You can see this one just has four cards. I will say though, if anyone is uh, planning on using one of these things, 
Um, there's different RAM configurations and different speed units. There's the, uh, and, and you can tell that off these serial numbers. Um, I won't go into that depth here, but um, if you've only got a one meg unit, you need special firmware packages to actually run those on. They're not available on the internet. So Shiva, like many companies in the 90s, got bought out by another company, and that was Intel. Intel ended up buying them to access their network products. Um, and I think also they were trying to tap into the Apple market, um, which they didn't have much access to. And uh, so what's happened is all of those firmware packages, floppies, CDs, etc., that were on Shiva's FTP 25 years ago would have been purchased by Intel and then they've just been, you know, they've been dumped through time. And this is the problem that I'm always working towards here at the ACMS is the fact that I worry that technology that existed before the internet, particularly before 2010, doesn't exist because uh, most FTP, SFTPs, HTTP websites, they weren't crawled and even if they were, a lot of these software packages, firmware updates, software updates, etc., unless the company is still actively keeping them running now, you just won't find them because people weren't caching them, putting them on their own servers. Um, it was too expensive at the time and now we've got kind of unlimited um, resources, so now we do that. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you.